We are right around the corner from the start of the Ghislaine Maxwell trial. Today we're taking a look at the court docket for November 27th, which should be the last day before the trial officially starts. My name is Robert Gruler. I'm a criminal defense lawyer. Here is the docket. We can see 1127. We have three different entries, so not a very busy day. If you've been following this channel, you have seen a lot busier days than this one. And that's because we've got trial coming up on 1129. So 1128, of course, Sunday and 1129 is Monday. And so this was uh, the updates that came in on Saturday. Nothing too big here. We're going to take a look at these two entries, 512 and then 510. And you're going to notice that under both of these entries, both are referencing these preliminary instructions, the preliminary jury instructions that are going out to the jurors. And so uh, basically we talked about those in a prior video, but these were the preliminary instructions sort of explaining just to the jurors where you're gonna go, what you're gonna do, you know, don't talk to anybody. A couple minor specifics for this trial that they're gonna be using pseudonyms and that a lot of this stuff is gonna be testifying under uh, you know, sort of alternative names and that, that not to hold that against any of the witnesses that were going to be called forward. So some of those details, but the rest of it nuts and bolts. And so what we're talking about are the prosecution and the defense responding to the proposed jury instructions. The judge came out, Judge Allison Nathan, and said, here's what I'm going to tell the jurors. You guys have any problems with this? And so they're both responding. We're going to take a look at those. And then we have a little bit of an update from Galen Maxwell's main lawyer. Her name is Bobby Sternheim. Talked a lot about her. She submitted a letter that was addressed over to the judge asking for some details, some specifics about a trial document procedure. And if you've been following along, you know that this defense team has a lot of expert witnesses, a lot of people who are going to authenticate documents and create timelines and uh, do all these you know, forensic presentations about this, that, and the other. And they want to know how can we present this stuff to the court. So we're, that's what Bobby is asking the court saying, judge, can we get some clarification on this? So let's take a look at these. As I mentioned, we're talking first and foremost about the jury instructions, the preliminary instructions that are going out, you can see that this is the response by Maureen Comey. This is James Comey's daughter, the prosecutor, uh, writing for the U.S. government. You can see her name here. This is a photograph from her. She responded back on November 27th, says, Honorable Judge, the government respectfully submits this letter in response to the court's draft preliminary instructions. The government has no suggestions. We also have no objections to the court's draft. And so, like I said, pretty much boilerplate language with a couple of those permutations for the special uh, uh, victim, uh, victim and witness protections that the court put in place. And this goes over to the, to the defense. Do you guys have any issues with this? Jeff Pagliuca for the defense says, nope. Also, no issues. On behalf of our client, Ghislaine Maxwell, we write in response to the court's request for comments on the proposed preliminary instruction to the jury. The defense has no objections or edits to propose. Also submitted November 27th by Jeffrey Pagliuca. I got a photograph of him over here. So uh, not too much unexpected there. Judge proposed some instructions to the jurors. This is where you go. This is what to do. This is what to say. This is what you cannot say. And some of the details, neither side had any objections or edits, so that's going to happen tomorrow morning. On Monday the 29th, when the jurors come into court, they're going to be read those preliminary instructions, may, might even be handed a copy of them, and that's all going to go without a hitch. So nothing uh, too big there to report as far as jury instructions go, at least the preliminary jury instructions. Remember, these are going to be very different from the jury deliberation instructions back near the end of the case when the jurors get the instructions in the law and then they apply those to what they heard in the case. We also had on 1127 an update from Bobby Sternheim. This is Galen Maxwell's attorney, one of them, and she's sort of the person I've been considering to be the head attorney, the, the lead on the case. And so you can see this is coming directly out of her office. All of these attorneys are from different offices except for Laura Menninger and Jeff Pagliuca, they're both from the same firm. But here, Bobby Sternheim, she's got this on her letterhead out of New York, New York, Broadway Suite 715, says, Dear Judge, on behalf of our client, Galen Maxwell, we respectfully submit this letter to request a clarification of the court's instructions regarding the use of paper documents versus electronic documents at trial. So we've got this issue now. We're all prepared and ready to go. Should we fax this in? Should we bring it in on... Uh, a cart 
and deliver a stack of a thousand pages on your desk or can we just email this over to you? In particular, says Bobby, the defense is still unclear whether we will be permitted to display documents used for impeachment or refreshing a witness's recollection in electronic format solely on the video screens used by the witness, the court, and the jury's deputy, or whether we will be required to provide paper copies of these materials, even if the materials do not reference a witness who is testifying under a pseudonym. So a lot of complex uh, document issues. Footnote number one says, counsel for the defense understood the discussion on November 23rd to apply only to documents which contained identifying information for witnesses who are testifying under pseudonyms or first names. The government, however, has suggested that paper documents need to be used for all impeachment and refreshing whether or not the documents contain such identifying information. Okay, and so now we've got a whole kind of slew of complex things going on. We've got witnesses, we've got victims, we've got documents that might use some of those people's names, the actual witnesses' names or the victims' names, that might want to be used as impeachment materials. So it, it, somebody comes and says, uh, during trial, they say, this happened on this date. But previously, they have a different document, maybe an email, where they say something else happened on that date. And so now we've got these documents. So how are we going to be submitting those? Or how are we going to be using those in courts? If a witness comes in and says X, Y, and Z happened, but we have a document that says that same witness said, nah, -uh, A, B, and C happened. How do we submit that document that says A, B, and C? Because we got witness first names, we've got all sorts of privacy protections and pseudonyms, and it's complicated. So can we just put this up on the screen? Can we submit this for Vic? I got a thumb drive here. Is that good enough? Or do we need to bring in paper copies? And so the government wants it one way. Uh, court has given us some clarification on this, but it's confusing. We've got all these different buckets of different people and different documents and different ways of getting the documents into the court. Help us out, Judge. Can you help clarify this? The letter continues from Bobby, says... The defense is sensitive to the court and the government's concerns that people sitting in the gallery of the courtroom do not see any documents that identify the witnesses who are testifying under pseudonyms. We also understand that the court wants to ensure that the witnesses will have access to the complete documents that may be used for impeachment and refreshing recollection rather than a particular page. For complete, compl they want the full documents. We have considered these concerns and would like to propose a solution that we believe will address these issues and safeguard the privacy interest of the witnesses and at the same time provide for an efficient trial and protect Ms. Maxwell's rights. The defense proposes that the parties be permitted to display documents used for impeachment or refreshing recollection only on the video screens used by the witnesses, the court, and the court's deputy. None of these screens face the gallery or the jury box and cannot be seen by anyone in the audience or by members of the jury. Documents will not be displayed on the screens at council table, which face the gallery, or on the jurors' screens. Okay, now we can get some clarity on this. So Bobby Sternheim and Ghislaine Maxwell's lawyer, they're saying, listen, rather than sort of this all-or-nothing approach, rather than uh, we have to just you know, either splash it on the screen and everybody everywhere sees it, everybody in the gallery, the media, cut. we just cut over to you know the, the PowerPoint, boom, it's everything, or... We go the alternative and nothing goes out. We have everything on paper documents and we just bring, you know, carts of uh, wheelbarrows full of paper in. Neither one of those sounds ideal. So Bobby Sternheim and the defense they're proposing, how about this? We're going to bifurcate the video feeds. So when we're talking about these sensitive documents that might implicate witnesses or have their names or have something that might identify them saying, well, if that witness that we rewind back to our prior example on, we say, well, they said X, Y, and Z. Our document says A, B, and C. A, B, and C might not specifically have that victim's name in it or that witness's name in it. But somebody might know, oh, A, B, and C, I was there. I was there. I, I know who was there at A, B, and C that was also sort of connected to the Epstein-Maxwell case. Maybe that's who that person is. So it's sort of identifying that. So anyways, none of that A, B, and C, none of the X, Y, and Z, none of that 
proposes the defense goes out onto the public screens. We're only going to keep it limited to the people who need to see it. The deputy, the court, the witness, the jurors are not going to see it. Nobody in the media is going to see it. Nobody who's a part of the public courtroom or the public media feed is going to see it. And that's going to do everything that we want. It's going to protect the privacy rights of those witnesses, but it's going to allow us to use our technology and to use the media, the electronic forms of this media, to do the appropriate impeachment. So Bobby Sternheim continues. She says, while the defense may display a particular page of a document to the witness to impeach or refresh the recollection, we will have the complete document available in electronic form now. So we don't need to bring in a whole phone book of documents. We'll have the whole thing if we need it, but we're just going to use the document that we need, flash that on the screen to impeach that witness. If the witness witness wishes to see other pages of the document, no problem. We can display those pages on the witness's screen at the witness's request. So to make sure that everything's full and complete. Most importantly, this process will allow counsel to highlight or direct the witness's attention electronically to particular section of the disclosure materials without having to describe the particular paragraph number or the sentence in sometimes voluminous, dense, multi-page FBI 302 reports. Additionally, it will ensure that the witness is looking at the correct exhibit rather than other potential impeachment material in a binder before them, especially since defense counsel is not placed in a position within the courtroom that permits us to see what exhibit or page the witness has open in front of them on the stand. Finally, It will obviate the need to approach a witness, which is difficult with the COVID protocols in the courtroom setup, to direct the witness to a particular exhibit or a section of the exhibit. A lot of benefits there, according to Miss Bobby Sternheim. She says, listen, this is a complicated process. We've got all sorts of COVID protocols. So if I bring in a phone book of disclosure material and I say, hey, you're going to need all 2,000 pages of, the, of this puppy to refresh your recollection, and, and they're flipping through it, and they're going, what page? Uh, uh, you say, turn to page 2,000. What are you talking about? Flip this over. Oh, this is really Hold on, Chuck. Can I get up and approach the witness? Get up, walk over there, flip it over there. Okay, scroll down here. Go to the bottom. Right. right there. Read this paragraph. Right here where my finger is. Okay. Re- okay, does that refresh your recollection? Uh, yes, it does. All right. And, and so you, then she go, sits back down and you got to do the whole thing you know, to restart your line of questioning. What Bobby is asking is, Judge, can we just put it on the screen and I'll just flip right to it and we'll just say right here. I'll just highlight it, this sentence. So that the, the witness can just refer to that. And if they say, well, I don't remember where any of that else comes from. So no problem. I'll sc- you want me to scroll to the top? Scroll right up to the top. Right down to the bottom. All the way up down. And you can see a lot of other good reasons here. We can just highlight it. There's going to be a lot of documents, going to be like, you know, a wheelbarrow full of paper in here. Reams and reams and paper. It's going to be like Dunder Mifflin, especially since the defense counsel is not placed in a position within the courtroom. They can't go up there and see any of it. And so, Judge, this is going to be very useful. Can we do this, please? The government, according to Bobby, says it does not require copies of any of the 3,500 materials or the government's exhibits. If defense uses any documents to impeach or refresh recollection that are not included in in the disclosure or the government's exhibits, we will provide paper copies of those documents to the government before we show them to the witness on the witness screen. So if the, what she's saying here, if the government is going to be stingy about any of this, if they want paper documents, no problem. We'll give them copies of the paper documents, but can we still use this? Because it's going to be a lot more efficient for us as we're going through our our lines of questioning with our witnesses says we have conferred with the government and they do not agree with the proposed procedure. They do not agree to the proposed. They do not want to do that. Among other things, they express concern that a juror might see the witness screen, but the jurors are permitted to know the identity of the witnesses testifying under the pseudonym. So That concern seems unjustified to the defense. We believe this process will adequately safeguard everyone's interest and provide for a more efficient trial. And we respectfully ask this court to approve this procedure. Signed by yours very truly, Bobby Sternheim. So why might the government not want a highly funded, extremely technologically sophisticated defense team to take control of the technology in the courtroom. 
huh, I wonder. Maybe it's because they'll be just embarrassed by it because the defense is going to come up they're going to have their exhibits in perfect working order and they're just going to be able to fly through it and they're going to be like splicing and splicing and dicing all the different data in together to impeach these witnesses in real time control f search for the word pop it up boom go right there what did you say then oh how about on this march 15th oh what'd you say then right on the screen and the judge is going to have to decide if they're going to be allowed to do that. Prosecution would prefer that not to happen. So they would like the paper documents to be rolled out in wheelbarrows. And so that was the November 27th docket update in the Ghislaine Maxwell trial. Trial starts Monday, November 29th, and we've got a lot to cover. So make sure that you stick around. I'd love it if you subscribed, gave this video a like, left a comment below, and I'll see you on the next one.